At Taro, Burma, northwest of Mogong, the art of jungle living is illustrated for American troops. The rudiments of local cooking, makeshift style, are explained to a GI class by Naga natives. Also, plants and other growth common to this area are classified as to their edible values. Next, the party goes out into the jungle for field demonstrations, with both Burmese and Australian vets as instructors. The GIs are introduced to bamboo shoots whose core is edible. Flowers and plants which contain water fit for drinking are given proper identification. This training is of intrinsic value in view of the harshness and isolation of campaigning in the Burma wilds. Survival is often a question of how much the individual soldier has learned about improvisation. For instance, how to make rope from bamboo to tie together the sections of a lean-to shelter. The Australian veteran demonstrates the accepted procedure for putting together such a shelter. A grass covering provides protection against the elements. In addition to its employment for shelters of this type, bamboo also comes in mighty handy when an emergency raft must be constructed. The poles are fitted and lashed together as shown. And you don't have to be a mechanical whiz to figure out the best assembly. In an emergency, it almost comes natural-like. And so the CBI soldier learns what to eat and how to travel, jungle style. Wherever similar conditions prevail, the procedure's about the same. A pilot on Guadalcanal puts the machete to one of its countless uses as he shows how cooking and drinking vessels can be made from bamboo. The machete is flicked like a tennis racket, with wrist kept flexible to prevent the hand from tiring. Bamboo has ridges running solidly through the trunk, making each section a separate watertight compartment. At this Air Force school on Guadalcanal, Air crew members are taught how to survive indefinitely if cast away on a South Pacific island. The soldier learns that the only parasite-free water sources are trees or vines. A six-foot section of the ropey vine shown here yields approximately half a cupful. He saves some of the water for cooking purposes. Applying his knowledge of edible plants, He's picked sweet potatoes, string beans, and eggplant for his dinner. Food has been gathered, water obtained, cooking utensils made. So now the pilot slits and notches a bamboo stalk to make a fire pot. Bamboo shavings supply tinder. Even if you've never been a Boy Scout, you should have an idea as to how to proceed from now on. It's as easy as all that. Incidentally, matches should not be kept in emergency kits. They should be carried on the soldier's person, carefully sealed in a waterproof container. Jungle cooking has one cardinal rule. If you're not sure, boil it. Take no chances with parasites. Tonight's menu is vegetable soup. The vegetables are cut into pieces and cooked slowly over a small fire. If there's any doubt in selecting vegetables, a set of simple safety rules should be applied. Avoid all kinds of milky sap. Do not eat fruit and plant seeds. Never eat plants or fruits that have a bitter taste. To get ready for bed, the pilot collects palm fronds from which to weave a dry sleeping mat. Why sleep on the damp sand? A simple in and out basket weave is used. Hats and other useful aids can be made in the same manner. While awaiting rescue, relax. Make the most of what's at hand. Keep all clothing, no matter how hot it is. Get water even before food. It can be simple if you'll combine good common sense with careful application of fundamental training principles. Late November on the Aachen Front, the American 9th and 1st Armies were driving on Ruhr River objectives approximately three weeks before the surprise German counteroffensive. 
Below are trenches dug by the Nazis as part of the area's elaborate defensive system. The enemy manned these fortifications with small arms and machine guns. And according to observers, when we laid down a barrage, he retired to the protection of cellars in nearby villages with which many of the trenches connect. At Eschweiler, captured on 22nd November, a typical stretch of Hitler's superhighway before Cologne is put to use by American forces. A mile or so east of Eschweiler, the town of Eisweiler has been captured on the 26th. A bridge connecting with the superhighway is rushed to completion by combat engineers. This forward progress by our armies continued despite stiffening enemy resistance. But behind it all, the Nazis were preparing for their major counter blows, which were to become a grim reality on 16th December. Field Marshal von Rundstedt's troops struck south of these troops, who were struggling through the mud in the Aachen sector. At the time of these pictures, our drive dominated the Western Front, with not even adverse weather conditions stalling our advance for too long a period. In some places, the roads were virtually impassable, with deep mud bogging down men and equipment. A frontline salvage operation. Jeep rescues Jeep. A 155 self propelled gun is fired point blank at an observation post inside Frentz, Germany, northeast of Eschweiler. Range 2,000 yards. Five direct hits are scored. Opening fire on objectives across the Ruhr River. This river, now 500 feet wide, including the flooded area along each bank, flows northwestward about midway between Aachen and Cologne, entering the Maas at Ruhrmont. WP shells explode on the east bank of the Ruhr. Fire is directed from an OP just south of Jülich. Several hundred miles south of Aachen, Alsatians fight flames in villages to which the Nazis set the torch before fleeing the area above the Swiss border. An advance spearheaded by the 1st French Army has succeeded in turning the flank of German positions in the Vosges. The breakthrough brings elements of the 6th Army Group to Malouz and the west bank of the Rhine. Additional films of the Malouz siege show final skirmishes leading up to the city's liberation. The civilian population of 10,000 has taken shelter in the cellars of houses and factories. The bag of prisoners includes a number of officers. Part of the staff of the German 19th Army were taken prisoner at Malouz. Alsatian patriots parade into the freed city. During the German occupation, they were subjected to forced labor. While Malouz is being reduced, Saarburg, at the north end of the sector, falls to 7th Army units. The swiftness of the advance by General Patch's troops forces the enemy to abandon many weapons. Due east of Saarburg lies Sabern, which is captured on 22nd November. On the following day, Strasbourg is reached. At saint important highway terminus below Strasbourg, roadblocks were built by the Germans to stem the Vosges offensive. An abandoned 77mm howitzer overlooks the only roadway leading to the summit. 81mm mortars apparently rushed into position as the Americans approached. Captured Russian machine guns, approximately caliber 30. The Nazis also used captured Russian ammo. In addition to the gun emplacements, the Nazi defenses included a system of trenches, the construction of which was interrupted by the entry of our troops. Additional evidence of enemy precautions before the Rhine plane at Imling in the Saarburg sector. Camouflage 20.3 centimeter guns. The enemy's materiel losses have mounted with each new push by the combined French-American armies northeast of the Belfort Gap. Here, a wooden framework and haystack were used to conceal the 20.3-centimeter weapon. 
At Strasbourg on 26 November, a total of approximately 10,000 prisoners are ready to be moved to the rear. Included is General Fatterot, commander of the Strasbourg garrison. The officers and men will be transported southwest to Apinau, from whence they will be sent to Allied internment camps. Women prisoners, members of the Nazi equivalent of the WAC, several German army nurses are included. At Apinau, on the way to the rear, just prior to the December German offensive, the total number of prisoners taken since D-Day was 750,000. The enemy's estimated total casualties, including killed and long-term wounded, not less than 1,250,000. GIs sometimes do more than just dream about a cold can of beer. Here's a refrigerator made of airplane parts salvaged on Quadraline. Two layers of paneling from a wrecked B-24 form an air-insulated case. One pound of Freon from an aerosol bomb is transferred from the anti-mosquito front to this empty walk-around oxygen bottle. A valve controls the distribution of the flit turned refrigerant. The junk liberator, which donated the case, also kicks in a de-icer motor. The motor pump builds up pressure in the refrigerant. That liquefies the gas. When the compressed liquid in the bottle is released into the coils, the lower pressure lets it vaporize back into gas, but cold. From de-icer to icer, that's the story of these salvaged fuel lines doing as coils. Operating in them, the pound of chemical refrigerant will last as long as the island made frigid air. Snacks from the states used to spoil as soon as opened, but not now. And in the freezing units where ice cube trays belong, eggs promoted from the natives keep fresh. November on Leyte. Elements of the 24th Infantry Division, Major General Frederick Irving commanding, advanced toward mountain positions dominating the Ormoc Road. By the fourth week of the new Philippines campaign, the stubborn enemy is contained in a valley corridor. The valley is threaded by the north-south highway running from Pinamapoan to Ormoc. Ormoc is the key western port used by the Japs as a funnel for reinforcements. Snipers and mortars render every foot of the advance dangerous. An American news photographer is fatally hit by a Jap sniper. Two other correspondents expose themselves to help him. Wounded are brought out as the 24th, operating in conjunction with the 1st Cavalry Division dismounted, closes in on Mount Kataraban, or Breakneck Ridge. By 22nd December, headquarters of General Douglas MacArthur is able to announce that pincers from north and south have doomed the few Japs still holding out in the corridor. Ormoc Bay, 11th November. Jap destroyers seen below lay a smoke screen as planes from Admiral William F. Halsey's third fleet strike a convoy attempting to land some 8,000 reinforcements for the Japs on Leyte. Hell divers pound three large and one medium transports, five destroyers and one destroyer escort. A pattern of near misses. The Jap convoy with most of the 8,000 troops is sent to the bottom of Ormoc Bay. Cost to the third fleet, 10 planes. left landing gear jammed, a homing Hellcat comes in on one wheel. The 
the pilot is able to walk away. Another F-6F, its tail hook assembly damaged by flak, is forced to rely on brakes alone for deceleration. The dazed pilot is helped from his cockpit. Rear Admiral Frederick C. Sherman's task group steam for a strike at Luzon on 13th November in one of a series of blows at the heart of General Tomoyuki Yamashita's defenses. Over Manila, heavy flak greets attacking Avengers and Hell Divers. Manila Bay's dock area in flames, airfields and other installations on Luzon also undergo dive bombing. Carrier planes strike again at Manila Harbor facilities. A tally, one light cruiser of the Notori class, badly damaged. Two destroyers exploded. Eleven cargo vessels and tankers sunk or damaged. At nearby Cavite, Avengers score four torpedo hits on the floating dry dock. Many bomb hits are also made on yard facilities. Eighteen of twenty Jap interceptors are shot down. <laughs> 